what I want to do today and maybe over the next few weeks. You know, we've been in a series right now, The Day of His Power, and we're going to continue that series uh, probably in October. I'm not sure exactly. It'll probably, the latest will be October. But I felt the need for us, based on the conference and the prophetic word Terry had at the very end, for us just to pause. I think a lot of times in the prophetic, we just want the next word and we don't want to just deal with the word God gives us. <clears throat> and so we want to just pause for a moment and just say, okay, Lord, what do you want to do with that word? And, ba and basically the, the gist of Terry's word was that there's a need for repentance and there is a need to take communion to seal the work that God has done among you. And I, I believe that work was really referring to not just the conference, but the season God has had us in. And so we felt the need to just to pause and just say, okay, God, deal with us. Lord, we want to be brought into that, we want to be brought into that place of repentance, dealing with what those things you want to deal with us. Now, unless you've been in a cave, you realize the church right now is in, under the judgment of the Lord. We've been under the, the judgment of the Lord for some time now, but especially it's been intensifying as bigger ministries are beginning to be exposed. You know, we've seen what happened with IHOP. You know, we've seen what happened with other ministries. Just, just even the last week or so, we saw what happened with Morningstar, with Chris Reed. You know, God is, God is right now judging the church because that tells me that judgment's coming to the world. God judges his church first before he judges the world we are experiencing the judgment of God right now. <clears throat> and it's very important that in that time that we, we don't just be like self-righteously looking at this ministry or that ministry or this minister and that minister and say, oh, wow, I can't believe they did this or I can't believe they did that or get them God or whatever we would do. But we look at our own selves and go, okay, Lord, what is it in me that needs to be, I need to repent of and change? You know, we can have a very self-righteous attitude sometimes and not realizing, no, God's not just coming for those, those, or those. He's coming for us. He's coming for this church because he wants a pure bride. And judgment begins in the house of God before it begins in the world. That's just basically the scriptures. And so... What I want to do in this message today is just talk about kind of this uh, season that we've been in from April 2024 until, you know, right now, just for whatever, how many months that has been, and what the Lord has been speaking and the prophetic things God has been saying to us so that we can really get the mind of the Lord, get the mind of the Holy Spirit in us. And so... I want to start by reading uh, Revelation 19.10. So to go ahead and if you have your Bibles, turn to Revelation 19.10. I love this scripture verse. This is a beautiful, beautiful scripture of the way the Lord is, uh, the way the Lord moves and what the prophetic is meant to be. Revelation 19 verse 10. And John, of course, is encountering the Lord and, the, and he's getting the revelation of the marriage supper of the Lamb and the marriage testimony and all that is there. And he sees in verse 10 that he falls at, at his feet. Some, some say this is an angel. Some say it's a messenger. We won't get into that debate right now. But the messenger, the angel or the messenger says, do not do that. I am a fellow servant of yours you and your brethren who hold the testimony of Jesus, worship God. And this is where we're really going to get out here is the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. True prophecy is not meant to predict who's going to win the next election. True prophecy is not like a fortune cookie you get at the Chinese restaurant that says, turn left and you will have a great destiny. Okay? Unfortunately, so much of the charismatic, prophetic, Pentecostal church that we would be part of, we are definitely... Believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, practice the gifts of the Holy Spirit, but so much of that stream or tribe that we belong to, the prophetic has become pathetic, and we've missed Revelation 19.10, the testimony of Jesus. All Old Testament prophecy and all New Testament prophecy ultimately is meant to bring us to a greater unveiling of the man, Christ Jesus. 
Now, not every single word that's given is, is directly related to Christ, but it's not this, you know, this, what we've seen in the charismatic prophetic community has become just absolutely, this is nothing to do with Scripture. And God's exposing that. God's exposing the prophetic. God's exposing the prophetic to show how pathetic it has become to get us back to Revelation 19.10, the testimony of Jesus Christ. And so it's, you know, the testimony of Jesus Christ is the revelation of Jesus Christ, who he is, his work, what he accomplished on the cross, his body, the body of Christ, the local church. And what he's saying to the local church, what he's saying to this local church. You know, because uh, if you just notice in Scripture, God moves, the way God moves, he moves in seasons. I mean, he orchestrated the, the four seasons that we experience, especially here in Georgia, as fall and winter and spring and summer. God moves in seasons. God works in seasons. And that if we don't discern the season God's moving in, we'll miss the moving of the Holy Spirit. And we want to just make sure we don't miss what the Holy Spirit is saying. Like, for example, in Revelation 2 and 3, Jesus moved in different seasons in the church, in, in the seven churches of Revelation. Ephesus was in a season where God, he confronted them and said, return to your first love. They were in a season where the Lord was saying, lay down your external ministry and come back to first love. The church of Thyatira was in a season where Jezebel had come in and produced false prophecies and idolatry and sexual immorality, and God was saying, don't tolerate this in your midst. They were in a season where God was saying, don't tolerate that in your midst. Sardis was in a season where the Lord was saying, you have fallen asleep. Wake up and strengthen what remains. And that wasn't just to be, one of the things in the prophetic is what I found is we, we just kind of, want the next dopamine rush in the prophetic. We just want the next word in the prophetic. We just want the next apostle or prophet to give us a word, the now word of God. And we don't really wrestle with what God's already spoken to us and pause and say, God, what are you looking for from me? God, see, the purpose of the prophetic is to bring transformation, not just a blessing to you. The purpose of the prophetic is not just to bless you and say, my brother, Michael, you're going to have an awesome destiny and God's going to use you greatly in the nations. No, the purpose of the prophetic is to bring transformation, to bring the testimony of Jesus Christ out, to bring us into conformity, into the image and the nature of Jesus Christ. Now, God does, listen, God does give encouraging, comforting words that we give to individuals, but the ultimate purpose is not for them to have their blessed their best life now or their destiny is to come into what God is saying to the church, to the church in this hour. So that said, that God moves in seasons. God moves in prophetic seasons. And we want to be in alignment with the moving of the Holy Spirit in the prophetic season we find ourselves in. Okay. That said, I want to share, I'm going to share some prophetic things that I believe God is speaking to us, has been speaking to us in this season we've been in, just to kind of highlight to us um, the, what the Lord is saying in this hour. We always want to know, okay, Lord, what is, the, what is the Holy Spirit saying to the church? See, if you're going to be a word and spirit church, which we want to be a word and a spirit church, a word church is a word that's gr a church grounded in Scripture. We want to be a church grounded in Scripture, and we want to be a church that's moving with the Holy Spirit. We want to have that balance and harmony of moving in the Holy Spirit and, and flowing in the Holy Spirit, but also being grounded in Scripture. We don't want to, you know, some of this charismatic Pentecostal stuff has gotten so far off the Scriptures. We want to be a word and a spirit church. We want to know what God is saying presently, and we want to know what God has said historically. We want to know both, and so we've got to be grounded in that. But it, we're right now in a season where God is, is saying to us, you need to know what the Holy Spirit is saying presently. Okay, so I want to share a dream that I had on April the 8th, and on uh, April the 8th of this year, and I think I've shared it once maybe, but I just wanted, I felt the need to share it again. But I had a dream that I felt like it was a God dream. I've, I've learned through trial and error. I remember, I was thinking back during worship, back in probably the 90s, the, the mid 90s, I got, I, you know, coming out of a Baptist church, I realized 
God speaks. I was like, oh my goodness, God still speaks. That's incredible. God still, you mean, you're telling me God still speaks. We can hear God like they did in the Bible because they didn't teach that in the Baptist church. It was like, you know, they were cessationists where the gifts have passed away and God only speaks through the word. But when I found out, okay, I can hear the voice of God, I got, I mean, really, I got crazily excited. I mean, thankfully you didn't know me then. <clears throat> well, some of you did. But I was like, Man, if you're breathing, I'm prophesying over you. Any dream I had, I, I remember I went to a dream conference, and it was uh, this guy, he was the chaplain of the Buffalo, no, the Colorado Buffaloes, and he was part of Promise Keepers, James Ryle. And he did this uh, dream conference, and I was like, this is awesome, man. This is so cool. We can hear God in dreams. And I just got so pumped up. And what I did is I started keeping a journal next to my bed, and every, every single dream I had, I, it, I could have eaten like supreme pizza the night before and had been up just regurgitating whatever the pizza made me, but I was up three in the morning writing it down. I mean, some, sometimes it's like three or four pages, and my, I had like bags under my eyes because I was losing sleep, and finally I'm like, okay, this is, this is probably, I need a little balance here, so I'm, I'm saying all that to be like, okay, over the years I've you know, learned, I think, to better recognize which dreams are from God and which are more the soul, which is more just the, the mind doing what it does in dreams, you know, when God breaks in. And so this dream, when I was in the dream, I really felt the presence of the Lord and I woke up like, okay, I'm in the presence of the Lord right now. And if you know me, that rarely happens. I rarely wake up in the presence of the Lord. I need like two espressos to get going to even think about getting into the presence of the Lord. But I woke up in the presence of the Lord. And, I, and just so it really made me, okay, I think this is a God dream. And so in the dream, it was, uh, I don't know if you heard, know Frank Viola. He's a pretty well-known author. Um, he was in the dream, but it was at Randall and Teresa's old house. And in the dream, um, and Randall Treaser, Randall's an elder at our church, and so what Frank Viola was doing in Randall and Treaser's house is he was putting old clothes into order like he was going to put it on sale at a garage sale. And so all over the house there was this stuff laid out everywhere. I remember just being a total mess. It was a complete mess on the inside. Um, and I remember two things in particular. I remember seeing receipts, and I remember seeing pens, you know, writing pens, and so I was like, oh, that's interesting. But I remember Frank um, was putting pens into a special container for pens. And I remember seeing a lot of workers helping Frank put those things in order. But I was, I was, as I was watching Frank put these pens into this container, I was thinking, I remember saying to him, you're really orderly. Does this type of order help you with your writing? I don't even remember what he said, but in the dream, I felt like, you know, sometimes you know the interpretation right in the dream. You know, if you're getting the dream, you know in the dream, okay, this is what this means, okay? So in the dream, I felt like Frank was coming into a greater apostolic function that would bring divine order to God's house and would help make the bride ready. Now, I don't believe, at first when I woke up, I was like, I mean, do I need to try to get in touch with him and share this with him? But I felt like the Lord was like, no, this is for you. This is for you. This is for restoration life. This is a symbol. And I, I, the, in the dream, Frank was being used in an apostolic way to bring divine order to the bride of Christ to help prepare her for the marriage supper of the Lamb. Okay. So what I felt like the interpretation was of the dream was, if you look in Scripture, the hill is always connected to the house of the Lord. You could look in Psalms 15, Psalm 24, Isaiah chapter 2, that it talks about the hill of the Lord and the house of the Lord. The hill of the Lord and the house of the Lord are always, con not always, usually connected together. And the fact that this was at the, the hill's old house, I think was really emphasizing the house of the Lord and the old that we must come out of. The old clothes that were going to the garage sale old mindsets, old coping mechanisms, old ways that we do things. You know, a lot of us, we, you know, God deals with us layer by layer like he's peeling an onion. And a lot of times God has to, God can't deliver us of every single thing all at once because it would, we would just be overwhelmed by the amount of stuff God has to do. So he sanctifies us little by little. So we come to Christ and we start following him and God brings us into the sanctification process. And then we realize, okay, you know, 
we're still doing some of the things we used to do before we were saved. We were, we're still have learned some old habits and old mindsets and old ways and some old patterns of living that we used to do when, before we were saved, even from, our, even from our childhood that we're still functioning in. And God was, was bringing out the old clothes being symbolic of the old man, the old clothing. And he was saying, take off the old man, like Paul said in uh, Ephesians chapter 4, take off the old man, take off the old man that's being corrupted in the lust of deceit and put on the new man. Get rid of the old and come into the new. Come into the new. <clears throat> And so it, it, that, that, that was what that, the clothes represents. Now, in the dream, as I waited on the Lord, I felt like Frank in the dream had three meanings the Lord was emphasizing to me. The first thing I think God was saying in this was the elders need to be frank. We need to speak truthfully. We need to speak boldly. We need to speak the truth in love and with grace. But we've got to speak the truth. For divine order to come, for divine order to come, the elders, dad, myself, Randall, we need to speak the truth in love. This is a time for frankness, to be frank, to be up forth, to be upright, to to just speak forth, not trying to cover, not trying to have flowery language or flattering language, but to really be frank. Sometimes you got to be frank. Sometimes you got to just be very truthful to bring the church into divine order. Okay? So I felt like that was the first thing that, that needed to be, that Frank was symbolizing. The second thing I think Frank was symbolizing is if you know Frank Viola, his uh, subjects that he writes about are God's eternal purpose, indwelling life, the church as a corporate expression of the indwelling life of Christ, the organic expression of Christ and in his indwelling life. And my, my feeling is, is that as we are speaking the word and speaking the truth and frankness and divine order is coming, it's going to bring a greater expression of the organic life of Christ in the corporate body to be what the church is meant to be. Not an organization, not a place you go to on Sunday, not a two-hour service, not something you go to, someone you are, as we are a church, a body, interdependent upon one another, together expressing the life of Christ. And then the third thing I think Frank was representing was a greater apostolic function that is coming to the church to bring divine order in God's house. And I believe that that's something God has been doing in this church and in other churches around the world. He's wanting to bring a greater apostolic function to bring about divine order. This is not about like, I'm an apostle, I'm going to put Apostle Brian on my business card, and I'm going to, you know, we've seen all that. That's just totally, absolutely nauseating. You know, Paul said an apostle was someone who was a scum of the earth and the, the dreg of society. Maybe you should put that on your business card. But it's like, you know, we're, we're the scum of the earth is basically what an apostle is. So if you're really eagerly to want to be apostolic or an apostle, you should read, I think it's either 1st or 2nd Corinthians 4, 3, somewhere in there. Maybe, yeah, 3, 2, somewhere in there. But to really see what God is, calls an apostle. I remember we were in the Ivory Coast in 2004, and we were, we were going there, and uh, that, I won't go into all the details because that would derail me from the point, but we were going there, and we were doing a, a pastor's conference, and they wanted really bad, they wanted us to do signs and wonders at the conference, and we don't really, I mean, not that God's never used us for those things, but that's not really our focus. We're coming to bring the word of the Lord and what the Lord's saying, and I remember we had all these, not all these, it was pretty small anyway, but we had a number of pastors came, and, and did the word that the Lord gave Dad was, the apostle is the foundation, and, if, and that the church is to be built on the foundation of the apostle. And if, if the church is built on the foundation of the apostle, you're not going to be seen. Well, he spoke that word and it went down to quote Terry like a rat sandwich. And I think it thinned out the crowd. And I mean, it was like a third, maybe a tenth of the crowd came back. And we're like, okay, well, we'll get started now. But that, you know. God wants to bring in an apostolic function in a greater way to bring divine order. We've got to bring, the, the church has got to come into divine order. And it is, I believe, a move of the Spirit of God to bring the true apostolic 
back into the church. Now, there's so many things you could say about that. And, and unfortunately, being in the charismatic Pentecostal church and seeing the way the apostolic has been abused, it's kind of one of those things where you get this, this kind of chalk on, uh, fingernails on a chalkboard reaction when you say the word apostle because of all the abuse you've seen over the last 20, 30 years in the charismatic church, I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about an apostle that takes the mountain of economics. I'm not talking about an apostle, the seven mountain mandate. I'm not talking about any of that when I talk about the word apostle. I'm talking about what, how the, the, the word was used in scripture of God bringing the apostolic to bring divine order into the local church. That God's raising up um, the apostolic to bring in divine order to the local church. Okay, the fact that I saw receipts in the dream. I just remember in the dream seeing receipts, and I was like, there's a pile of receipts. It's like, uh, you know, if you remember George Costanza's wallet in Seinfeld. I remember, do any, I know we're, that's a long time ago. Anyone remember George Costanza's wallet in Seinfeld? Okay. Well, in the show, George Costanza, I feel like my wallet sometimes becomes like George Costanza's wallet, where you just put receipts in your wallet over and over and over. And finally, in the episode, George was like trying to sit down and he threw his back out because he had so many receipts built up in his wallet. But that's kind of what this reminds me of is like God's bringing receipts. God's bringing, and when you say God's bringing receipts, it's God's bringing evidence. God's bringing, God's bringing the the facts. It's not just like this vague thing. Hey, you need to repent. It's like, no, you need to repent of A, B, C, D, and E. Here's the receipts. Here's what, here's what God's saying. Here's what you're doing. God bringing receipts. God's showing us with receipts those areas where we need to repent. Okay. I, I felt like in the dream that the pens had two meanings, two, two symbolic meanings, is that God wanted to bring divine order in communication and God wanted to bring divine order for communication. Now, this is what I believe in, in terms of divine order in communication. This, this can mean several things, divine order in communication, is that we are make sure that when we speak it, it, about the church or we have a word from the Lord, that this is divine order in communication. That, this is like saying, okay, don't gossip, don't, don't unrighteously criticize those in the church or the church or what we're doing. To follow proper protocols for communication, that we need to follow proper protocols. For example, this is what I mean. If the Lord gives you a word for restoration life, then you don't need to just go off and share it with a group of people is you need to make sure that you're sharing with the elders because the elders are the ones who have the God-given authority to govern and shepherd and uh, lead and oversee the flock, the church that God has given to us. This is, you know, we are an elder-led church with three elders, and we all have equal authority as a team to govern the church of Jesus Christ here and to shepherd and oversee. And therefore, if, you, if, God, if you believe God gives you a word and you just run off and share it with 10 other people and you haven't, uh, you haven't submitted it to the elders to say, okay, this is what I believe, and especially, especially if it relates to the church where we have the God-given God authority to direct and shepherd and lead, then that's out of divine order. That's out of divine order. What you should do instead is not just run off and share this with two or three or four or five or ten people. You should come and e email one of us and text us, whatever, and say, hey, I believe the Lord's given me this word for the church. Because one of the things the charismatic church has not done well is we have not tested prophecy very well. We are called to test prophecy. That does not mean you're going to quench the Holy Spirit. Testing prophecy does not mean you're going to quench the Holy Spirit. It means you're going to quench the soul, but not the Holy Spirit. And we want to quench the soul. We don't want soulish prophecies. We don't want a word from the Lord that comes from the mind, the will, and the emotions. We want the true word of the Lord. And so if you're off sharing a word that you have gotten from the Lord with a group of other people, and you haven't submitted to the elders for testing, then that's out of divine order. Amen? Okay, so we're not saying that to discourage people from hearing God. We believe, I mean, I think we've stressed over and over and over, no, this is what people do sometimes. They shut down and say, oh, well, they don't want me to hear from God. No, that is not at all 
what we're saying. We want you, we want everyone to hear from the Lord. We want everyone to speak for the Lord. Just we want it to be done in divine order. That is not done, you know, out, you know, people used to call it parking lot prophecies, you know, outside of the, the authority of the local church. Now, we want you to hear from God. We want you to hear from, from God for this church. I think we've, you know, emphasized this enough is that the church is not just, you know, 1 Corinthians 14, 26 is when you gather together, each one has a scripture, a psalm, or a word from the Lord, or a revelation, but everything's in divine order. Everything must be in divine order, and that's what we're really stressing, is that this, that this divine order is coming in communication, is we, we must have divine order in communication. And the other thing is, if, if you feel like, okay, well, there's an issue of restoration life, okay, the leaders are doing this, or there's, there's an issue going on, it's out of order for you to go and then talk to other people about that issue without talking to us. You see what I'm saying? Is we're the ones that God's given the um, authority to govern and correct and direct and things like that. And so for, if you were to go off and just go speak to two or three friends, hey, I think they're doing this wrong. I think this is out of order. Or I don't agree with this or whatever. Then... You're out of order if you do that without first coming to us and talking to us and saying, this is what I feel like is happening. Because, listen, we want to hear from you. We, all, we have blind spots. Um, it, that, if, that if we don't listen to you, we're going to have no one that's going to listen to us. So we want to hear, truly, if, if, the, if, you, if there's something going on, an issue that's going on, by all means, come to us, talk to us, and share with us, hey, this is what I, this is what I feel, this is what I think. Um, so there's divine order in communication. Does that make sense? Divine order for communication. As we come into the divine order of the Lord, as we come into the Lord's divine order, I believe it's going to, it's going to release a greater anointing in us to communicate. Whether that communication is through singing, whether that communication is through videos or media, whether that communication is through preaching, whether that communication is through the prophetic, whether that communication is through writing, however, however is meant to be the, the way God uses you to communicate the truth and the message God has given us, as we come into divine order, God then will anoint us to speak the message God has given us or given you to speak. Does that make sense? Is, is one of the worst things that can happen is for you to have a message but be out of divine order and then to speak that message not being in divine order. God does not bless things that are not in order. And we've got to come into divine order. Um, and so that's what I believe. Like if, if we will come into this divine order, God will, in, in communication, God will anoint us for communication. There will be an, I found that in my own life when I was out of order serving dad, thinking, and I've told the story before, thinking, oh, I could do this, you know, I'm God's man for the hour, and then you, you actually have to do it, and you're like, okay, this is like really hard to lead a church. Uh, you get humbled quick, and you realize, okay, uh, he did an awesome job. So anyway, but when I got, when I came into divine order, submitting to my dad's authority many years ago, what that did for me is it brought, it brought an anointing to communicate the message God had given me. Because a lot of times we want our own ministry, we want our own thing, we want our own ministry. But the Lord says, how can I give you, this is Luke 16, how can I give you your own thing? And I'm just going to use it in this context to paraphrase it. How can I give you your own ministry if you're not faithful with another's ministry? And you see that all throughout Scripture. How can I give you your own ministry that you lead? How can I give you a ministry in this area? How can I give you a ministry in that area if you're not faithful to serve the ministry that you already are under, that God has placed you in? Does that make sense? There's divine order. And so when we come into divine order, God then anoints us for communication in the context of that local church. Okay. When I talk about divine order... Just want to just make sure we're clear on what I mean by divine order. Um, is divine order in Scripture relates to relationships, relates to authority, relates to the church, relates to spirit-led living. God has ordered in the Scriptures the arrangement, structure, and pattern established by God for relationships, church structure, spirit-led living, even civil authority. 
And so just, you know, here's a few examples here is their spiritual authority. You know, 1 Corinthians 11, 3 talks that, says that Christ is the head of a man and God is the head of Christ. And I won't go into all the details of that passage, but that we are, the divine order begins with each of us, like we were singing about today, submitting to Christ. See, divine order begins inwardly and then it's reflected outwardly. If, there's, if, there is, if, there, if there's outward fruit that shows there's things out of order externally, well, that means there's something wrong inwardly, internally. Divine order begins inwardly. It begins in the heart. It begins in the mind, the will, and the emotions. If we're going to come into divine order, God's divine order, then it begins inwardly within us, not externally. The external flows from the internal. And if we get the order mixed up, we'll, we'll be out of divine order in and of itself. God's divine order is the inward first, then the outward. And the church, for the most part, is the outward, then the inward. And that's not divine order. Divine order is Christ in you. Christ, you submitting to the headship of Christ in you. The Spirit of Christ in you, bringing you into submission. The Spirit of Christ in you, ruling and reigning in you and through you as King and Lord. Where that you have resigned your own will, your own ways, your own methods, your own system. You've surrendered that to the Lord so you can come into the divine order of God so that you can be a Spirit-led believer. Spirit first, soul second, body third. That's divine order. So there's divine order where Christ is the head. And we come into submission to Christ. The, the other area of divine order is the spirit-led life. Paul said very, very clearly in Romans chapter 8, we are under obligation, brethren, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. If you're living according to the flesh, you will die. But we are under obligation to live by the spirit the Spirit-led life is not something reserved for Pentecostals and Charismatics. The Spirit-led life is the very foundation of the gospel itself. It's the very foundation of sanctification. It's not an optional thing when you come to Christ, like, okay, well, today I feel like I'm going to live in the flesh, or today I'm going to feel like I'm going to live in the Spirit. No, you don't get the choice. When you come to Christ, He's Lord. He's Lord. You don't get the choice to say, okay, well, today I'm just going to live the way I want to live. No, that's not the choice you get. Paul warned, he says, if you live that way, you will die. See, divine order comes by saying, we are not going to live in the flesh. And what does Paul list as the flesh? And uh, Galatians chapter 5. Let's read it real quick. What God, what Paul lays out as the deeds of the flesh. We know these things, but it's good to be reminded of these things. Galatians chapter 5. Verse 19. The deeds of the flesh are evident which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, living by the five senses, idolatry, worshiping other gods, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, disputes, anger, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. That's the flesh. That's living in the flesh. When you are producing those deeds of the flesh, the problem is not the fruit of the flesh. The problem is the root of how you're living. So the problem is not that these things are, are manifesting. Yes, that's a problem. But the source of it is not the sins we commit, but the sin that we're yielding to, the sin nature, the flesh. Because we, until we get a new body, until we're resurrected with a new body, sin will dwell in our body until we are resurrected and glorified with Jesus Christ. So Paul is saying you're under obligation. Divine order, the spirit-led life begins this way. Spirit first, 
your human spirit joined to the Holy Spirit, living together as one, the Spirit of God and your spirit living together as one, that life source there, where the, the life source of the indwelling life of Christ there then flows outward into the soul. So it's spirit first, soul second. The soul, the mind, the will, and the emotions coming into submission to the leading of the Holy Spirit. And then under the control of the Spirit of God, the soul then directing the body to do what God is saying to do and to refrain from those things God is saying not to do. That's divine order in the spirit-led life. Divine order in marriage. There's a clear, and I'm not going to get into all the details in this, but Genesis 2.24 lays out marriage very clear. There's a union between a man and a woman for life that brings a, a couple together as one flesh. And you can look at Ephesians 5.22 through 33 to see the divine order within marriage that the, the husband is meant to be the head. Now, husbands, before you say, hallelujah, praise God, you're not, uh, you're not permitted to be the head until you love your wife like Christ loves the church, which means sacrificing, surrender yourself to him. It's not like the Middle Eastern Islamic marriage that, where, you know, we just say, submit to me, woman, and do what I says. The Bible tells me. So that is not what Paul had in mind at all. Divine order in the marriage, listen, it begins with the man saying, okay, I am going to go and I'm going to surrender my life to Christ and I'm going to go hear what he's saying for me and my wife and our family and I'm going to go, and this, this doesn't mean the wife isn't hearing too. We're, you're, once you get into the, the synergy of this, you're hearing the same thing together. I remember when we first got married, oh my gosh, that was a nightmare, mainly because of me, but I remember, you know, I was prophetic and I didn't have much wisdom, and I remember the Lord told me something, and Angie didn't like what the Lord told me. I, I do believe it was the Lord, but the way I carried it out was very wrong, and she was resistant to it, and she says, why, why did he give me a word? And I said, well, God spoke to Adam and not Eve, Okay. <laughs> Don't ever do that, okay? If you, unless you want a terrible marriage, don't ever, ever do that. That will ruin your marriage. God spoke to Abraham, not Sarah. They were supposed to submit to what God had told the husband, okay? That is not going to go well. <laughs> that's not going to go well. And that's not the divine order God has in mind. God has in mind a mutual submission, and you can read it in Ephesians 5, a mutual submission to one another with the husband being the head of the house and the head of the relationship, as the husband is loving his wife like Christ, which means laying down his life for her. Okay, that means doing the honey-do list. <clears throat> Actually, <laughs> I better not, I'll say that I better get struck by lightning if I keep going down that path. But I've done good the last two, three months with the basement. So, yeah, 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 yeah. The honeydew list. Now, now she's going to target me with the honeydew list after preaching this message. But divine order in marriage is beautiful, but it takes time. It takes time. It takes time to come into that divine order. Um, and there, there's so much more I can say about that. But anyway, I'll, I'll move on. Divine order in parenting. Divine order in parenting. I guess a lot of the children are not in here, but the importance of showing honor to your parents, the importance of parents raising children in the admonition of the Lord. And, and let me just say this about parenting, that the church is not meant to be the primary vehicle or mechanism or catalyst or channel for your child being discipled. The church is not meant to be the primary channel for your children to be discipled. You are. Now, how you go about doing that, you know, you've got to be led by the Lord to show you how to disciple your children in the Lord. And you've and you got to know their personality and you've got to know the way that what works best for them and what they receive and resist and all that. I mean, 
Some, some families can do like daily devotionals and, you know, sit around the table and read scripture together. I mean, growing up, if dad tried to do that with four boys, we would be like, yeah, that ain't going to work. I think he tried that once maybe, and he's like, no, nah, we won't do that. But what came, what happened was we would just go play basketball, and it seemed like uh, John's team always won, and, you know, Stephen's team lost, and it would be, you know, whatever happened after that, the door slammed, and we would go in, we would cool off or whatever. And then just naturally, organically, conversation would just flow that centered around the Lord. And that was so beautiful. It wasn't anything we tried to force. It wasn't anything we tried to make happen. Now, I'm not saying doing devotionals like that is wrong. It, it's, it's, it's all, it, everyone, you've got to just do what works for you. And, you know, for us, it, it just is kind of that same way at our table. We'll just be talking and, you know, things like that. And I, um, I'll have to share one, one story about Anna. I will, I will not go into the, spe the specifics of it, but just the other day, how just listening to her, she was sharing the gospel to someone, and I'm sitting there going, Anna the Baptist, you know, instead of John the Baptist, Anna the Baptist calling someone to repent. I'm like, this is incredible. We're not like sitting down and laying out, hey, here's the four spiritual laws, or I was like, but hearing her talk, I was like, wow, that's amazing. Talking about you're not saved by good works. And you know, I was like, wow, I didn't think he even listened to me, but awesome. She doesn't, but she maybe gets a little bit that sinks in. But parenting, divine order in parenting, divine order in children honoring parents and parents raising their children in the Lord. Um, divine order in church. Divine order in church. This is really important. Now, this is like, the, if you're following the things that are going on in the charismatic Pentecostal church right now where God is exposing leadership, abusive leadership, carnal leadership. I mean, in, in many ministries that I've respected over the years, God's exposing them for what they've been doing in darkness and in secret. God's exposing them. This is like the worst time in the world to talk about divine order in the church because of spiritual abuse. But the scriptures are very, very clear that there is divine order in church. And that is meant to bring about the full headship and flowing of Christ. Now, if you have the wrong leadership, if you have leadership that are living in compromise or living in carnality, listen, to be a leader is incredibly God's, you know, listen, God's exposing these things because to be a leader, James said that, that not many of you should be teachers knowing that we will have a stricter judgment. God exposing leaders in the church is because leaders have a stricter judgment because they are giving direction and leadership to God's people. And Jesus said that it would be better for you that if a millstone was tied around your neck and you were thrown into the bottom of the sea than for you to cause one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble. That's sobering. That's sobering. For those in leadership, I mean, it's like to cause one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble is a sobering thing, to be a stumbling block to God's people. That's why God's exposing the abuse in his church. That's why God's exposing the carnality in leadership right now. And I just imagine we've only seen half of it. I don't know that prophetically. I'm just saying there's probably so much more God is exposing. But I look at that and say the reason God's exposing this is because God is exposing it to bring in divine order. There is a move of the Holy Spirit, and Terry was talking about this in his message on Saturday morning. He says, everyone's crying out, we need revival, we need revival, we need revival. And Terry was saying, no, we don't need revival. We need divine order. God pours out his spirit when there's divine order. God pours out his spirit when there's divine order. When Judas fell, the, the apostles had to replace Judas' leadership position with another apostle before the spirit was poured out. Divine order comes before the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Can you imagine if we had an Acts 2 outpouring of the spirit with the church being like it is in its condition with the type of leadership we have in the church of carnality and all the things that are being exposed?
Can you imagine if God really poured out his spirit without divine order? It would be utter chaos. So God right now is exposing the abusive leadership in his church to bring about those, God's raising up shepherds that are after the heart of God. May we, as leaders here, be those kind of shepherds who are after the heart of God so that God can bring divine order. The elders are going to have a stricter judgment than, the re than those who are not elders. Okay? So if you think, well, I want to be a an elder. Well, okay, G your judgment seat experience is going to be far more extreme because God is not going to allow you to, like, if you don't, if you don't lead well, if you lead well, you'll get a crown of glory. You'll get a shepherd's crown, like it talks about in 1 Peter 5. But if you don't lead well, the judgment seat experience will be absolutely awful for leaders. Okay? I know that. I, a, li a little bit. A little bit. So that's why for elders, our judgment seat experience is going to be much more severe, especially, especially if we're a teacher... You can pray for me. But I also believe if we do it well, there's also rewards for that. So, you know, that's another topic. But the point is, is elders give an account of the judgment seat of Christ for how we shepherded, led, governed, instructed, corrected, or whatever at the judgment seat of Christ. But also the church, those who are not elders, are meant to, um, like it says in Hebrews, obey their leaders. Now, you know, that, that, makes, that honestly makes me feel a little comfortable. It's not like you're just blind submission. But there is a place of, of honor, like it talks about in Timothy, that we show double honor to the elders, especially those who teach. I'm not looking for honor by any means. I'm just laying out what the scriptures teach. And so there's this divine order in the church that God is moving to bring into place, okay? Okay. So there's this divine order God wants to bring into the church. God wants to bring that divine order. And it's not never meant to be they're better than you, they're more special than you. I assure you that's not it at all. I can hear God better than you. No, you can hear the very same kind of stuff if you will draw near to the Lord. Um, like, like even Michael today was saying, hey, the, the Lord gave me that very same scripture, Romans chapter 12. God gave me that very same scripture this morning. I was like, wow, that's amazing. So... Everyone can hear the Lord equally. Now, yes, God does speak some leadership things to leaders only, but, but we can all hear the Lord. You can, you can hear the Lord yourself. It's not like this hierarchy. It's not, this, this is not a hierarchy we've seen in the church where, you know, it's like this, these are the tops, and then God only speaks to the people at the top. That's not what I'm saying, okay? That's not at all what I'm saying. But there is divine order in this, and as we come into that divine order, it, we come into the, the full blessing of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. There's civil authority. I'm not going to get into that just for time. Okay. Um, but divine order is very important. If we, get, if, if, we wanna, if we want God's peace, blessing, and harmony, we've got to come into divine order in every one of those spheres of life. And if any time our, our life is out of order, it usually means we're not in divine order. Okay, so just, to, just for the sake of time, I want to move on. Uh, I have more in the notes, but I'm not going to go into all that right now. If you want to see them, you can look at those. I, I want to get now into Terry's message that he shared on Saturday. Okay, so you, you see the emphasis on divine order. We've been talking about divine order since about April, maybe even, even sooner than that. We've also had six, we've had, uh, I think we've had six prophetic words from different people, five dreams, one prophetic word, uh, related to the topic of divine order. So it's, it's clearly, clearly a theme God's been laying out to us at this church. Now, when Terry comes on Saturday, I, I always try to make sure, okay, when Terry's coming, I don't want to share with him anything that's going on in the church because I don't want him, uh, I don't think he would, but I don't want him in any way to be influenced by some of the dynamics going on in the church and for him to prophesy out of any kind of natural knowledge. I want what he shares to be 
the word of the Lord to us. So I have not shared anything with Terry. And so the Lord gave Terry a message. He told me this before he came. So even if, even if our, in our conversation we, something may have spilled out, it, what, it did not influence what he said because he already had the message before he came. And I listened, I, I did a transcript of, it, of Terry's message to us on Saturday, and he said the word divine order 24 times. Okay? Sometimes when you're listening to Terry, there's so much, you're drinking from a fire hydrant, and you're like, what do you talk about? And you're like, I mean, he spoke for three hours. What do you talk about? Uh, Jesus and the cross and readiness. And, you know, there's so much that is coming out. But that's significant, okay? 24 times, 24 times he said the word divine order. We, I remember we were riding up to uh, the conference in July where Terry was speaking, and sometimes uh, Terry gets someone in his na name in his mind and just says it like repeatedly. In this conference, it was Michael and Michael. It's like, Mike, is that right, Michael? Isn't that right, Michael? And I kept thinking, okay, wait, is there another person over here, Michael? It's like, Michael, Michael? But I remember we were riding up to the conference, and he, he, Madeline got on his, uh, in his mind, and he said, isn't that right, Madeline? And we still, me and Angie and Anna were riding up there. We're like, man, if we were playing a drinking game, we would be totally wasted if we took Madeline. And anyway, we was like, she said Madeline like 50 times. And we, we get there, and um, we get there, and anyway, we were talking. We, we actually met Madeline. And uh, anyway, it was, what was funny was Anna was talking to some of her friends. I was like, hey, Anna, come here real quick. She's like, why? Why? What do you, what do you want? Uh, I was like, come here, come here, come here real quick. I want you to meet this person. I was like, hey, Anna, do you know who this is? She's like, no, this is Madeline. She started dying laughing. But anyway, 24 times... 24 times, Terry said divine order. Okay, that is significant. That is significant. I, I consider Terry one of the foremost prophetic voices in the earth. That's my opinion. You can agree with me or not. That's fine. That's my opinion. And for him to come to our church and to confirm what God has been clearly speaking. Now, there's a reason, okay, okay, God doesn't just randomly speak this because it's like, oh, well, I don't know. We need to give Brian something to talk about. And divine order, you know? No, there's a reason for it. That means we're not in divine order in some areas. <laughs> I mean, sometimes you just got to lay it out there logically, okay? If God is emphasizing divine order like he's emphasizing with six prophetic words, Terry coming and his main message is divine order, Okay, God's not just saying this because he needs to fill the space. No, there's something, there's things out of divine order God wants to bring into divine order. And, and if, you, if you want to, I, I put them in the notes. If you, I, won't, I won't take the time to go through everything Terry said, but I've got them in the notes. If you want to, they're on the YouTube channel. There's a link there that says, here's the notes. You can go to the YouTube channel, click the link, and you can see all the notes if you want to read about those things said, but the essence of what Terry was saying was divine order 24 times is that we, we don't just come out of Babylon into divine order randomly. We must come into divine order by, by what we talked about just a minute ago, the spirit leading you, you becoming a spirit-led believer, coming into the divine order that is in your inwardly to Christ in your relationships in the church, related to governments, external governments, and all that's involved there, that, that there, God's prescribed method for getting us ready is not revival first, but divine order, then the outpouring of the Spirit. That's the pattern we see in Scripture. Okay. Then Terry spoke um, from Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 15. This was so confirming to us. Is He said, the wall... And that wall in his message basically meant divine order leading to separation from Babylon. That was kind of how he applied it to us. Divine order leading to separation from Babylon was completed on the 25th of the month. The conference ended on the 25th. That was pretty, when I saw that I was like, okay, you can't make that up. You can't make that up. And I knew, I knew it was in reference to the season that we have been in. I don't believe, 
I don't believe that the season is completely done yet, but I felt like God was saying, okay, it's coming to a completion. That this conference was bringing this work to a completion on the 25th of the month in the month Elul. And Elul falls between August and September. It's like, wow, okay. The, co the conference ended on August 25th and Elul is August or September. Now I looked up here, okay, what does Elul mean? What is Elul? Elul is the month leading to the Jewish High Holy Days. Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, the Feast of Trumpets. Elul is a time, listen to this, especially with what Terry said to us. Elul is a time of reflection, repentance, and spiritual preparation. Okay? What was Terry's word to us? You need to repent and take communion. We're in a season right now of repentance. We're in a season right now where God is saying, okay, you need to repent. The month of Elul is seen as a period for introspection and returning to God. During this time, the Jews were encouraged to examine their actions over the past year and seek forgiveness from God and from others. One of the things they did during the month of Elul was they blew the shofar daily uh, at the end of the morning prayers as a wake-up call reminding people to seek, uh, to reflect on their lives and to seek atonement. And what also happened during the month of Elul is they had these special prayers and at these special prayers as, as the days approached to Rosh Hashanah, they had these special prayers that would begin to intensify as related to re the, the repentance. So the, the, the repentance, the intensification for the need for repentance intensified as they got closer to Rosh Hashanah. Well, this year Rosh Hashanah is October 2nd through 4th, and so I think what the Lord is laying to us here prophetically is He's saying this month of September is a month where the intensity of the, of the repentance is intensifying so that we can be prepared for the next season. Now, we know all this happening in the world and all this happening in governments around the world, all this happening in the church. So this is so important. This is so important. I, I learned this too, is that there's a metaphor associated with the lul. It's the idea that the king is in the field. And what it did is it symbolized in this month God is more accessible and ready to listen to prayers, offering his people the opportunity to draw closer. So what I want to say here is that this season is not just meant to be like, okay, I just got to find everything that's wrong with me. No, that's not what it's meant to be. It's meant to be God's a holy God. God wants to purify us and cleanse us so we can draw closer to him. I also found out that Elul, this is all in the notes if you want it. Elul is often seen as an acronym for the Hebrew phrase from the Song of Songs 6-3. It's, it's written in Hebrew, so I'm not going to try to loogie it out, you know, sometimes you want to speak Hebrew, you just go, you know, it's kind of, if you ever want to know what to say for Hebrew, just do a loogie. So I'm not going to try to pronounce that, but it translates to, I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. So Elul is an acronym that translates to, I am my beloved's and my beloved's is mine, showing that if we will respond in this season of repentance and really say, God, deal with me deep of the old mindsets, old patterns, old coping mechanisms, old ways, old patterns and habits. If you will deal with this old man, God says you will come into this relationship with him where you know I am my beloved's and my beloved's is mine. This deep intimacy and communion that we're entering into during the month of September. Okay, now... Terry's message to us on Sunday, his word to us was a specific word. Now, this, I take this very serious, okay? This is very, very serious, what he said to us, was he warned us about taking communion with a nonchalant attitude. And that, that's why we're not taking communion right now. We're, gonna, we're, wait, I'm wait, we're waiting on the Lord to find out, okay, Lord, when is the timing when we take communion to seal the work because he quoted to us from 1 Corinthians chapter 11 where 
the Corinthians, who were known for their carnality, they did not fear the Lord, and they kind of just came to the communion table hungry, and some of them even got drunk. I guess they had regular wine. Some of them got drunk from the communion wine, and they were just living like it was no big deal. And Paul said, no, some of you are sick because you haven't taken this seriously. Some of you have even died because you haven't taken this seriously. You're guilty of the... Listen, this is very sobering. You're guilty of the body and the blood of Jesus. So we don't really take communion like that, do we, anymore? We need to. That's Scripture. That's Scripture. And so, you know, I don't... It doesn't... Now, that's one side of it, but the other side is we don't mean to be so terrified that we don't take it. There's a balance here, but... What I'm trying to get at is there's a, a preparation that God wants to bring about. Um, Terry's word to us was, we are called to, I'm summarizing it, we're called to repent in areas where repentance is needed and take communion with a deep sense of reverence. He said, this will seal the work the Lord has accomplished among, among us. I take this to mean the work he's been doing starting in April all the way until right now. But Terry was asking, okay, um, I'm about to give you the word of the Lord. You need to take communion for the next several weeks as a seal of what God is saying through this word till we learn to tremble again. Okay, pause right there and let that sink in. As we need to take communion again, until we learn to tremble again. The fear of God. The fear of the Lord. Lord, may you give us the fear of the Lord in increasing measure. He said, I've never been that pointed, have I? The Lord told me to tell you that verse 27 was for us that whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. That's some serious, serious stuff, isn't it? Let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink the cup, not to dishonor the cup of the Lord, so we don't bring judgment upon us. But he said... The Lord will seal it, seal the work that he's been doing if we'll take communion. So we're still waiting on the Lord of exactly when are we supposed to take communion. But then we had, you know, Terry called us up to the front for repentance and things like that, which was really, really, really a good thing. But I just wanted to stress that, that I just want to make sure we understand what repentance is and what repentance is not. And I'm speaking just scripturally, but repentance is... Both in the Old and the New Testament, repentance is, is an inward change of heart and an inward change of mind when the truth comes and you see the gap between the truth and where you're at. Repentance is this inward change of heart and inward change of mind. So you think differently about it and it be, then leads from that inward change of heart and mind to a turning away from those things that are not aligned with the truth and a turning from those things to a turning to God. And so repentance is an inward change of heart and mind that leads to, that is reflected in the outward change of action and behavior. So get the word change and get the word transformation. Okay, repentance, I think sometimes we get repentance confused. Repentance is not confessing to the Lord your sins. Now, confession is part of repentance, but repentance is bigger than just confession. Because a lot of times we come to the Lord and we say, I repent of X, Y, and Z, and what we're really doing is we're confessing our sins of X, Y, and Z. Repentance means change, transformation. You think differently about that, and it's reflected in the change of behavior and action. Okay? 
Repentance and confession are not the same thing, though confession is usually part of repentance. Does that make sense? Repentance is not emotionalism. I've seen so many times emotional, tearful responses, and then they get up. Nothing at all has changed. That's not repentance. That's just crying. That's just emotionalism. Repentance is not guilt or condemnation. Guilt or condemnation produce nothing. Repentance is not moaning and groaning and morbid introspection or navel-gazing trying to find out every single thing that's wrong with me. Repentance is not merely feeling regret or guilt. It's not apologizing and asking forgiveness, though that, those things are sometimes involved in repentance. I just want to just make it real simple. Repentance is change. Repentance is transformation. Repentance is thinking differently, a turning from those things towards God so that we're now changed in an alignment with the truth God is revealing. That's repentance. Does that make sense? So what do you need to repent of? Okay, I've got ten things you need to repent. No, I'm kidding. I don't know. Ask the Lord. Don't go off. Listen, don't go off and start going, okay, this is wrong with me, 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 this is wrong with me. Say, Lord, what, do you, what are you saying that I need to repent of? What are you saying I need to repent of? Now, he might help you <laughs> with showing you those things or even through other people. In fact, he might very well help you by other people telling you, especially if you're married, have kids, boom, 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 these are the things right here you need to repent of. But I want to just highlight here 1 Corinthians chapter 4, uh, verse 5, where Paul said, I want you to hear this, I am conscious of nothing against myself. Okay, we need to, this is beautiful. But I'm not by this acquitted. In other words, I don't have any, there's nothing I know that's wrong, but I'm not by acquitted by this. The one who examines me, the one who examines you, is the Lord. Therefore, don't go passing judgment before the time, but wait until the Lord comes who will bring to light the things hidden in the darkness and disclose the motives of men's hearts. He's talking about the judgment seat of Christ, but I would say, let's ask the Lord for a pre-judgment seat of Christ experience. God, come to me right now in this season we are in, Lord, and bring your judgment seat. We're, we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Why not experience that right now where we can make changes and have a positive judgment seat experience instead of having our rewards burned by fire. You see what I'm saying? Lord, show me the areas where I need to repent. Shine your light into my heart to show me where I need to repent. See, a lot of times we want to repent of the acts, but we don't want to repent of the ways. If we repent of the acts but not the ways, we are going to repeat the same pattern again and again. We've got to go to the ways. We've got to go to the why, not the what. The what is the fruit. The why is the root. We've got to go to the root and say, Lord, why do I keep doing these things? What's the root? What am I rooted in that's producing this fruit? And so I just want to encourage you as we bring this message to a close. I just want to encourage you to spend, we're going to be spending this, this is a month, this is like a seeker sensitive type church here, just kidding, is this month we're focusing on not your best life now, but how bad you are, okay? So we're focusing, just kidding, we're focusing on repentance, all right? We're focusing on, okay, Lord, bring your light to us so we can see where we need change and not just remorse. Amen. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the way you have guided us. 
Thank you, Lord, for the Spirit of the Lord. We thank you, Holy Spirit. God, I pray for us right now. For all of us, myself included, I am, Lord, we are, we need you right now. Lord, would you, you're, Lord, we just, we just agree with Paul. The Lord is the one who examines me. Lord, I pray that you would come and you would bring to light the things in us inwardly that are in darkness. Lord, our patterns, our habits, our ways, our mindsets, our coping mechanisms, our paradigms and perspectives, Lord, mindsets, strongholds, Lord, things that we have developed over the years that we have been just living, and especially as we get older, just those things accumulate and we just function out of those without even realizing those. Lord, get to the very root of those things, the why behind the what. Lord, I pray that your light would come and expose. I pray that your light would come and reveal. I pray that your light would come and heal as well. Lord, would you come and bring the light of revelation to expose those motives and reasons and things we're doing, God, that are of the flesh so that we could come into the submission fully to the Spirit. And Lord, would you heal where you need to heal and would you deliver where you need to deliver? And we pray that in the name of Jesus. Have your way in this season, we pray. Have your way, Lord. Have your way, Lord. We just say in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So we'll uh, end the online portion here. And then, Shelly and Larry, could you guys come up just